Welcome back to AP Physics. It's time to ponder. In the last lesson, we were pondering forces on moving charges and applications on those. Now we're going to transition over to electric currents and magnetic fields and consider applications of those getting eventually into torque and electric motors. So far, we know if we have a charged particle moving in an external magnetic field, we can describe the force, F equals QV cross B. So as this charge moves into the field, it has a velocity, I would point my fingers of my right hand towards the right in the direction of the velocity, cross into the field, which is into the screen, and it will experience a force in that upward direction. Well, let's extend out a little bit and imagine that this charge is now inside a wire. And those that I've drawn in the green are the sides of the wire. I'm gonna draw a couple more charges in here. All of these charges moving off to the right, that constitutes a current. Note, I am using positive charges Sign convention, even though positive charges don't move, we still use that to denote the direction of electric current. Well, in the end then, what happens is all of these trillions and trillions of moving charges in the electric current all experience forces in that upward direction. And so then the net result on the wire, here's the wire just drawn without so much other stuff. If I have a current in this direction, then that current in that wire is going to experience a magnetic force. We need an equation that's more directly related to that electric current. So then if we take the equation we've been using so far, F sub B, that's equal to Q. I'm going to replace V by a delta X over delta T. Now, really that delta X is the length of the wire, and I'm going to abbreviate the length just with the letter L. So on the diagram here, and so this becomes L over delta T. And so then F equals Q L over delta T crossed into B. So that's going to be my magnetic force. I've got a Q over delta T. Q over delta T is current. That'll be I L crossed into B. Simple substitutions give us an equation there that's going to describe the direction of the magnetic force on a current carrying wire. Note on the direction of L. L is in the direction of the electric current, but L, the length, is your vector. I is not a vector. So let's consider more specifics on the right-hand rule here. So here we have a wire drawn diagonally upward. It is carrying a current also in that diagonally upward direction, and we have a magnetic field B going across the page. F equals IL cross B. You're going to point your fingers of your right hand in the direction of I. Rotate your wrist if you need to so that you can wrap into the direction of B, which would be in that direction. IL crossed into B should give you a magnetic force acting on this wire into the page. Now in the next example, we're going to look specifically at several different cases. Now let's look at a specific example on F equals IL cross B that gets into the directions and the right hand rule. So here we've got three different diagrams. Okay, we've got our values for I and L and B given, and we want to calculate the force acting on the wire in each one of these different scenarios, okay? Your force IL cross B, we've got all the values, so really what it's going to come down to on a lot of these is the direction. So on part A, my I 2.5 amps, length 0.45 meters, B.05 Teslas, that's going to give us a value of 0 0.0056 Newtons. 
Now, by the right hand rule, I L cross B, so I'm going to point my fingers of my right hand in the direction of I. I can rotate my wrist anywhere I want so that I can cross into B, which is going upward, my thumb point out towards you, and so that force would be coming out of the board in part B. Really, your math is going to look the same until you get to the angle, and then IL <clears throat> in this direction crossed into B. Your direction is going to be out, okay, and it'll be all the numbers you have along here except a sine of 35 degrees for the angle between IL and B. That's going to give us a value of 0 0.032 newtons, 0032 newtons. Part C, we have two different wires here, okay? IL cross B, the field is coming out towards you, and then the wires are in the plane of the board, so you're going to be at 90 degrees in terms of the sine of the angle. So the force values we're going to get on both of these are going to be 0 0.0056 newtons. Now let's consider the right hand rule. On wire one, I L, to be able to wrap my fingers out of the board, I need to rotate my wrist. So the force on wire one is going to be going downward. On wire two, I L, and I have to rotate so I can cross my fingers out here. My thumb is going to point up in that direction. And so the force on wire two will be in that direction. Now let's extend our understanding of forces on current carrying wires. So in the diagram there we have a green wire and a current moving upward to the right. IL cross B, if we apply that right hand rule, point our fingers upward to the right, cross into the field, we get a magnetic force in this direction. We're going to go through a lot of right hand rules. It's very important as we go through these that you do that right hand rule so you're used to getting these directions. What if we take that wire and we mess with a little bit? So if that wire is bent, IL cross B, purpose of a cross product, is to make the two things perpendicular. What this is doing to our wire, this would be the length of the wire from the starting point to the ending point. If you imagine breaking this up into differential chunks and you're integrating in each chunk due to the dot pro or the cross product, you want to be perpendicular. The end result of that is you're summing and getting a length from the start to the finish. So then in that context, when we do IL cross B, we're going to get a force that is in the exact same direction as the first diagram. Now, extending again, what if we bend that wire and we bend that wire so much that now that wire is bent into a loop? Let's consider our different sides. I'm going to deal with the square loop first and then transition over to the round one. So I'm going to call this side one, and side two, and side three, and side four. So then individually applying IL cross B to each one of those sides, and I'm going to put arrows to denote the direction of the current on each side. So on side one, IL cross B, my fingers go to the left, they wrap downward into the screen, and so the force on side one would be in that downward direction. Following around to side two, fingers point upward, they wrap down into the screen, my thumb would point to the left, and that's the direction of our force. On the top, fingers point to the right, wrap into the screen, force would go upward. On side four, fingers would point down to the bottom of the screen, wrap into the screen, or my thumb would point to 
the left. And so we can see here we've got all outward forces and your net force there on the loop is going to be zero. Over here on the round loop, the same basic idea. Side one, down there, you're still gonna get a downward force. It's kind of curved in terms of the wire, but you're still gonna get a downward force. Side two would be like right there side three and side four, and each of these forces are going to go radially outward. So even if it's not square or rectangular, if it's circular or some other shape, if it's closed, you're still gonna get a net force equal to zero. Now, extending that a little bit more, looking at the diagram on the left, side one is on the bottom, two and four on the right sides, and three is on the top. If you can imagine rotating that loop so that we pull side one out of the screen at us and we flip the loop over so that it is horizontal. And so then on the diagram on the right, side one would be right there facing us. Side two would be over there where the current is coming out at us. Side four would be over here where the current is going away from us into the screen and side three would be hidden in the back. I have on this diagram changed the direction of our magnetic field also. So on both of these, the magnetic field is going to the right. Considering our diagram um, on the right side, F equals IL cross B. On sides one and three, IL cross B, L is gonna be in the same direction, parallel to the external magnetic field, and so one and three are gonna experience zero forces. Two and four, IL cross B, you're gonna get a value for. So then on side two, applying the right hand rule, your fingers would point out of the screen, rotate your wrist so that you can wrap your fingers then towards the direction of B over to the right, and you should get your thumb pointing in an upward direction. Likewise, on side four, I'm going to point my fingers into the screen. I'm going to rotate my wrist so I can wrap my fingers over to the right side, and my thumb will point a magnetic force here. So nothing is going to change here in terms of forces, because the values of these forces are going to be the same. One's up, one's down, my net force is equal to zero. But my net torque is not equal to zero. These two forces are gonna occur at different locations, and because they occur at different locations, I'm gonna cause this loop to change its rotational motion if it is set up to do so. So then what we wanna look at next is how do we calculate what that net torque is. So now, Let's calculate an equation for that torque. Same setup we had just a second ago. So then the results of what we came up with on the force still apply. We had figured out that there was a force upward on side two and a magnetic force downward on side four. If we wanna calculate what the net torque is, I'm gonna start over here on the left side only to conserve screen space, net torque, we know the equation for torque. That's gonna to be an R cross F. Okay, so then R is your distance from the pivot. If this is a loop that is free to rotate, then it would naturally rotate about the center of mass, which would be a point in the center. And so then your radius would go out on either side, depending on which you were dealing with, from that pivot out to side two or side four. Well, on the diagram on the left, that side has a length of A, and so then I'm gonna label over here, this would be A over two, and this would be A over two. So then plugging into the torque equation, net torque, I'm gonna have an R cross F, or a torque for side two, combined with a torque for side four. We'll figure out the signs of those in just a second. So then on side two, R 
would be an A over 2. Cross product, for the diagram we have there on the right side, your radius and your force are perpendicular, so then that would be sine of 90 degrees. The force, that's your magnetic force, and your magnetic force is an IL cross B. So IL cross B, we're going to do substitutions into there. I is good the way it is, so I'm going to leave that I. L is the length of the side, and on side 2, the length of side 2 is B. And so then filling in that value here, that would be a lowercase b, keep your b straight. I L cross B, your length is up and down, your field is to the right, and so that's going to be a sine of 90 degrees, and then the magnetic field, capital B. This is only the torque for 2. We're getting to the torque from side 4. Let's do a little simplification on the torque on side 2. A over 2, let's see, both of the sines of 90 are 1, so they go away. So I'm going to have an A, little a, times I, times little b, times big B, over 2. And that accounts for everything that's still left there. Now, when we move over to side 4, side 4, the radius is going to be A over 2. at sine of 90. I L cross B, the length of side 4, is also lowercase b. And so what you end up with is basically the same expression for the torque on side 4 as you did for the torque on side 2. Now let's consider the directions of the torques on side 2, R cross F. If you point your fingers of your right hand to the left and you wrap them up into F sub B on side 2, then your thumb's going to point down into the screen. So this torque will be into the screen on side 4. If I go from the pivot, pointing my fingers towards the right, in the direction of R or A over 2, and I wrap downward to the bottom of the screen, my thumb is also going to go into the page. So these torques are in the same direction. So then basically I can just double what I have there. Well, when I double what I have, that factor of 2 divides out with the 2 in the denominator. And so then what I end up with for the torque is, and I'm going to rearrange the order a little bit, I, I'm going to group little a and little b together, and then capital B, the magnetic field. I group little a and little b together because a times b, if you look at the loop itself, a is the length and b is the width, and so that's going to be the area of that loop. So then I, a, b. We want to generalize out th this out a little bit more. This is for a single loop. Well, what if there were two, three, or more loops? Effectively, what that would do is add a multiplier in, because instead of i, it's 2i, or it's 3i, or whatever. So I would add a factor of n in. So then torque is n i a b. Now, one more generalization. Torque is a vector quantity. So we're getting a vector for an answer. We want to state what's over here on the other side in terms of vectors. So then what we're going to do is we're going to state this as a cross product, whereby we're going to let A, the area, be an area vector. And we've done that before. And that area vector is going to point perpendicular to the area. So then, right hand rule, go to the diagram on the left. If you wrap your fingers around in the direction of the current, then your thumb is going to point the direction of the area vector. So then the area vector on the diagram to the left would point directly out at us. If you go to the diagram on the right, same idea. Your 
fingers would wrap into four and come around and back out through side two, then your area vector would point vertically upward. And so we're gonna restate this final equation as the torque is equal to Ni A crossed into B. Let's kind of summarize that and bring it together. So here's your total torque equation, torque on a current carrying loop, NIA cross B, where that cross, that sine of theta, that is the angle between A and B. And to find the direction of A, you're applying the right-hand rule that we just summarized, NIA cross B or NIA sine theta. Now, sometimes the equation you have in the middle here if you think about n, number of loops, that's a characteristic of the coil. I, that's the current in the coil. A, that's the area of the coil. Since all of those are characteristics of the coil, those are sometimes grouped together and given the symbol mu, which is the magnetic moment. The magnetic moment, the word moment is used, kind of drawing us back to the idea of moment of inertia. Those are all characteristics of your coil, and so sometimes they are grouped together as a single quantity associated with the coil. Generally, when I'm doing problem solving, I will use the version of the equation right there, NIA cross B, because that spells out everything we need to. So now let's consider an example. We have a coil of wire made of 50 turns, and so that would mean that capital N is equal to 50 turns. The radius of the coil, three centimeters, so that radius is going to give us the ability to calculate the area. We have a current of 2.5 amps, and we place it in an external magnetic field of 0.33 teslas. Now, let's consider working out the example. I want to do the directions, and so that's why I'm doing it in, up here on the marker board. So if I draw a coil, so there is my coil of wires, okay? I'm going to assume that the current is traveling around in that direction, okay? My magnetic field. over in this direction. So then if we want to calculate the torque in part A, where the coil is in the plane parallel, which is the way that I've drawn it here, torque is equal to NIA crossed into B. So that's gonna be 50 multiplied by 2.5 amps times your area a circular loop you've got the radius so that's going to be pi times 0 0.03 meters squared multiplied by your field 0.33 teslas on the diagram here if i wrap my fingers in the direction of the current then my thumb is going to point the direction of the area vector and so my area vector is going to go in this direction note that is a different right hand rule than we've used on cross products, it's a wrapping. Fingers wrap in the direction of the current. Thumb points the direction of the area vector. So then I've got a right angle there. And so then this is going to be the sine of 90 degrees. This is going to give us a torque value of 0.12 Newton meters. Now, torque is a vector. So then Thinking of it in terms of a vector, um, NIA cross B. Here's A wrapped into B. My thumb's going to point into the, the uh, marker board here. And so my torque's going to be into the marker board. What does that mean in terms of the rotation? Well, if I have a torque vector in that direction, my fingers will wrap and tell me what direction it's rotating. So this is the vector direction of the torque. 
but just kind of to understand the rotation, that means that it will rotate in a clockwise direction. A little bit more visually. Here's my loop. Okay, the area vector right there. A crossed into B. My axis is going that way, so this loop would rotate over in that direction. Now in part B, we're rotating the loop. The coil is now at a 30 degree angle to the magnetic field. So if I redraw my coil, so now I've rotated it downward 30 degrees. My current is still going in that direction. I'm gonna draw my magnetic field still horizontally to the right. By rotating it, what's happened now is my area vector is over there to the side. So then here's the 30 degrees that I've tilted the loop downward. So that means in NIA cross B, the angle that we're going to need is going to be the complement of 30 or the 60 degrees. So torque is equal to NIA cross B. Our values of N and I and A and B have not changed. So basically what we had before but now it's times the sine of 60 degrees. So everything that we had before gave us the 0.12 Newton meters. And then sine of 60 degrees, that's gonna give us a value of 0 0.10. Now in terms of the direction, NIA wrapped into B, that still puts our torque vector into the board. And if it's into the board, we're still going to rotate around in that clockwise direction. Now, let's extend from the problem solving into a fuller understanding of what this loop is going to do. So again, the figure I have drawn there is the same loop that we've been dealing with. So from our base equation, F equals IL cross B. IL cross B on side 2, coming out of the screen. Uh, wrapping into B is going to give us a, an upward force, and on side 4, it's going to give us a downward force. So then that we have a net torque. As we just saw in the calculation, the loop responds and it rotates. So then let's kind of extend through that thinking a little bit. If we bring the loop over here, but now what I'm going to do with the loop as I'm going to rotate it a little bit from where it was, still in the same external magnetic field that we had before. Now, considering the force on sides 2 and 4, well, IL is the same, B is the same, the directions haven't changed on sides 2 and 4 for anything, and so you're going to get exactly the same force you had before. Upward on 2, downward on 4, so then you have the same situation here in terms of the force. If we again rotate this a little bit further, so if I bring it down here and now I'm going to rotate still the same external magnetic field. Now if we draw our forces on the sides, still the same I, still the same L, still the same direction on everything, we're going to get exactly the same force here and Also here, whoops. So then your loop is going to rotate, at least up to that point. Now, if we, again, pull another copy of the loop over, but now I'm going to rotate it even further. So we go to here, still the same external magnetic field. Your I's and your L's and your B's are all in the same direction, and so then what we'll get are exactly the same forces we had through all of those situations. Now, let's consider what's happening to the loop. Well, if a loop has those forces acting on it, then it's going to experience a torque, and if it experiences torque, it's going to rotate as we've drawn it. Now, as soon as we pass 
this situation right here, now all of a sudden we're pulling to cause this to rotate backwards. So it's rotating in a clockwise direction, but once we get over here to this situation, that torque is gonna cause it to rotate back. So we're gonna get loop to rotate from the horizontal. It's gonna go up until the orientation of the plane is vertical. It's gonna pass up, and once it passes up that vertical orientation, it's gonna to continue to rotate. It has inertia, it's in motion, it's gonna continue in motion until you get to that point where it passes and now your torque switches directions and it's gonna cause it to rotate backwards. So it's gonna slow and eventually gonna stop and going to rotate counterclockwise. So then what you have in this situation is something that will oscillate. Well, fun to ponder, not too practical. If we want this to continually rotate, then what we can do is change the direction of the electric current. Let me rotate this a little bit further. So at this orientation, if I can change the current inside two to go into and the current inside four to come out of, then my force on side two. I'm just gonna draw in our external magnetic field. Then doing the right hand rule for IL cross B. IL will go into the page for a screen for side two. So then wrapping into B, that's gonna give me a magnetic force that is in this downward direction. Likewise, down on side four, if I point my fingers of my right hand out of the screen and then I wrap them into B, this is going to give me a magnetic force that is upward. And the end result is that your loop will continue to rotate. Now, to be able to get it to continue to rotate, you will have to switch the direction of the current. When it got to the vert the loop got to the vertical orientation, we had to flip the current. When it rotates 180 degrees and it reaches vertical orientation again, we'll have to flip the direction of the current. So we will have to flip that direction of the current every half rotation. And in that way, we will cause the torque to result in a continuous rotation. That idea is the basic idea of an electric motor. So here we have the basic concept of an electric motor. You have a loop inside of a magnetic field and you have current flowing through that loop. Once you have current flowing through that loop, that loop will rotate as long as you switch the direction of the current periodically. And a simple way to do that is with the device that's shown right there, which is called a commutator. It's basically split contacts. You can switch the direction of the current and you cause a continuous rotation, which we're gonna look at here in animation. So here is our magnet on the outside, our coil on the inside, the plus and minus with the red wires over on the left side, that is a power supply. You can see the commutator, the red disc with the black line in the middle. It's just basically a split contact. So as that rotates, the wires will change which side they're touching. And so then let's start it rotating. So the switch in direction of the current causes the torque to maintain its direction and causes a continuous rotation B is in a constant direction, but the current changes by the function of the commutator, the split contacts. Now you notice for a second there when the gap, the black line is vertical, you have no current. The loop continues to rotate based on inertia. We rotate it faster just because it's fun and we can you can see the whole process occurs more rapidly. So what are electric motors used in? Anything that rotates 
<clears throat> that is not run on gasoline. If it's run on gasoline, that's an electric motor, separate area of physics, thermodynamics. If it's rotating, it's not using gasoline, it's probably using an electric motor. Simplest application of that would be a fan, ceiling fan, any normal fan, any fan that is used like in the uh, cooling system, uh, in a computer, other rotating things, such as the propellers on a drone, those are run by electric motors. Wow, that's been a lot of pondering. Even the cat's tired. She pondered some torque and curled up into a ball. Have a great day.